by uh, introducing assets similar to what other company does. But, uh, you know, not everyone might like your joke. And uh, instead of doing something funny, you may end up with being accused of misleading the consumers and piggybacking on someone else's renowned um, brand. So please be careful when, when you're dealing with these situations. And one last trap, the right to image. So it is kind of straightforward. And the main rule is that whenever you want to use someone else's image and be it a celebrity or your employee or someone you know random from the street you need to acquire their consent and of course there are exceptions to this rule for instance no one uh, expects you to gather consent of those thousands of people that are on the photo you know the crowd but in general when it comes to game creation most of them will not be uh, useful for you so this is what you should uh, remember about. Uh, okay, so now that you got acquainted with a bit of theory, let's get back to recreating reality in our game. And I guess it makes most sense to start with creating a scenery that is buildings uh, and places. So obviously, recreating real life cities, real life buildings is nothing new. Uh, here you can see some examples. So you have Los Angeles depicted in Duke Nukem 3D and in GTA San Andreas where it is depicted as Los Santos because GTA in general uh, is a parody of California cities. And here we have some newer examples, Assassin's Creed Unity with Paris and Assassin's Creed Syndicate with, uh, with London. And even newer ones. Spider-Man with a very, very uh, detailed depiction of New York City and uh, Blue Burst Medium from last year uh, where they depicted the Hotel Krakowia, which in the game is called Niva. And actually, if you have some time, you can take a walk uh, near the old town later on and you can see it in, 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 in real life. Okay, so now that we've seen what others did, let's... Uh, take a look on how they did it. And as you can imagine, buildings located in New York, Tokyo, or, or Paris uh, will be protected as a rule by copyrights. And this protection, as I mentioned before, is usually granted for a particular period of time. And uh, in ideal world, we would be checking when a particular building was built and when their creator died, and then we would make sure uh, you know, like when the, the rights uh, went to the public domain, but it's not feasible and it's definitely not reasonable. Uh, you, would have, you know, you'd need like 200 lawyers in your legal department. So what I think is uh, useful is to assume that as a rule, all buildings like 150 years old up uh, are safe to use and safe to recreate. Uh, okay, so great, we can put some old churches in our game, but what if we want to recreate 20th century city or 21st century city? Well, does it mean that you have to do everything from the scratch or worse, you have to apply for consent of every single architect that created every single building in particular city? Actually, luckily, no, because most countries introduce the so-called freedom of panorama exception. And uh, thanks to this, uh, you are able to recreate what you see from public spaces like street or square without applying for consent. And, and this uh, law, this exception, the freedom of panorama, can be sometimes broader, like in England, in the UK, where it uh, spreads not only into exteriors, but also to interiors of, of the buildings. But it can be also very limited, like, uh, like in Finland or, or Norway, uh, or it can be almost non-existent, like in the Ukraine, for instance. And the bottom line here is that if we want to reproduce, recreate the old town of Krakow or the city center of London, uh, we do not have to spend thousands thousands of dollars on asking for permissions and so we can simply recreate every single building that we see. But 
as always, uh, when it comes to law, it depends on what you're going to create. And as to any rule, there is always an exception. And uh, one of the exceptions uh, is the result of the fact that old, bin old buildings uh, undergo renovations and that some parts of those buildings might be actually uh, subject to separate copyright protection. And one of the best examples of such a situation will be the Notre Dame Cathedral that after the fire was renovated and it actually still, is still being renovated. So it will be hard to depict the cathedral as a whole without depicting the, the, the new parts. And uh, another potential trap when recreating building is the interior. So as I mentioned before, in the UK, you are free to recreate the interior of the, of the building uh, thanks to the freedom of panorama, but in most cases it won't be the case. So you probably will have to either ask for consent or come up with your own interior design. And uh, the third element that you should be aware uh, are of are the landmarks or the so-called iconic buildings. Um, sometimes such buildings that are important for a particular city uh, can be subject to additional protection and in order to use them in a commercial project and video games usually will be considered uh, as such, uh, you might need to acquire additional consent. And the best example of such a situation is the Empire State Building. And we're going further with the list of watch out for. So, uh, when assessing whether a building is safe to use, remember that some elements of the buildings, like uh, lighting, decorations, posters, or street art like graffiti, uh, they might be uh, subject to separate protection. So, although you can recreate the whole building you know, as a whole, uh, you still should probably ask for consent if it has separate graffiti or, or sometimes even a sculpture, etc. And the best example of the situation actually is the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower, Tower. Uh, the one you can see uh, in the picture is perfectly fine to recreate. It's old enough, you can put it in your game and just do it. Uh, the problem is uh, when you decide to uh, recreate it at night because the lighting uh, is protected separately. So this thing is a no-go unfortunately because the illumination was created in 1989 and, is, uh, and if you want to recreate this particular illumination, you need to get consent. And uh, another not that obvious examples of, of traps are the fact that although you can depict the building in itself, you cannot depict the architectural plans of it because they are uh, protected separately. And one more trap is the photographs. And uh, this one is uh, surprising to many people, but let's imagine you want to put a Colosseum in your game. You're free to go. It's old, un unless renovated, but uh, feel, feel, feel free to do so. But what if you find a photograph of a Colosseum on internet and you want to put it in your game? Then I'm sorry, but uh, you cannot do it because the photograph was taken much later by someone who has the rights to this particular photograph. And at this point, I would like to show you a real case related to recreation of the interior of, uh, in, in video game. So, uh, video game Resistance Fall of Man uh, from 2006 depicted the interior of the Manchester Cathedral where the player was fighting some aliens. And uh, such use of the cathedral's image sparked uh, controversy among the, England, uh, the Church of England, and they decided to sue Sony uh, for copyright infringement and for um, sort of, um, uh, you know, like uh, abusing uh, the image of the cathedral uh, and in a city where there was a major gun problem. And uh, church officials, as I remember, wanted some donations, apology, of course, and support 
uh, to crime fighting organization in, in Manchester. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, in response, Sony, Sony obviously denied that there was any copyright infringement, and they were right to do so because, as we mentioned, in the UK you can recreate the interior of the church, but uh, they decided to apologize to the Church of England for the turmoil they caused uh, by uh, introducing the, the shooting scenes in, in the cathedral. And this case perfectly shows how important it is to pay attention not only to legal part, because on this side Sony was more or less safe, uh, but also to some social, cultural and uh, other contexts that uh, you may portray your uh, real life assets in. Uh, okay, so now that we have our buildings and our city, let's take a look at inhabitants of our city. And uh, let's see whom we can use in our game in order to make it safe. And if not, how we can make it safe. So, uh, let's start with historic persons. In general, when it comes to people of the past who are long, long gone, uh, you do not have to acquire any consent. So, if you want to put Caesar, Queen Victoria, Napoleon, or anyone else who lived a long time ago, you are Free to, free to do so. And in case of persons who died more recently, who have living relatives still around, you need to be prepared for potential legal bonds, uh, like the one EA is facing with, with Maradona, uh, or the ones that Activision had to face when family of Jonas Savimbi, an Angolan politician, decided to sue Activision for their depiction of Savimbi uh, in uh, one of the Call of Duty games. The family, the family claimed that uh, the, pic the, the way he was portrayed was inaccurate, it was negative, it was hurtful, he was depicted like a tyrant, and they didn't agree with it. So the, the case went to the court. The French court decided uh, that the lawsuit should be dismissed. But uh, still, Activision had to deal with public opinion, with the court case itself and, and related costs. Uh, okay, so you already know how to take care of the uh, image of people who are gone, but what if your dream is to make sure that one of the characters has the face of a famous celebrity? Unfortunately, I don't have good news here and there are no shortcuts here. Uh, each, every time when you want to up, uh, you know, to put uh, someone else's face image in your game, you need to obtain their consent to do so. And in such cases, uh, please remember to make sure that you um, properly state the scope of usage of the image of such a person. Um, so what I recommend is not only thinking about your current project. So, oh, I want this actress in my game right now but think broader, so think about your future projects. Maybe you want to have a second part of the game and use the character. Think about marketing, think about advertising. You all need the consent to use this person's image there as well. Think about maybe merchandise related to the game. So when you are uh, concluding a contract with a famous person, or um, not famous person, but person, real life person who, who's gonna be in your game, try to make it as broad as uh, as possible. And here on the slide you can see an example of such usage of image Keanu Reeves as Johnny Silverhand in Cyberpunk 2077. And obviously so the project wasn't the first developer to use uh, an actor or uh, another famous person in their game. Many developers do so and uh, in this case I am sure that they had proper contracts in place but sometimes it may happen that the developer forgets to conclude a contract or developer doesn't want to conclude a contract for financial reasons, obviously cooperation costs, or sometimes the developer, the studio, might be even unaware that one of the artists used someone else's image as a reference and put uh, someone else's face in the game. And let's take a look at a real life case. So Riot, the, creator, uh, the creators of League of Legends, 
introduced the strike illusion skin that depicts your, your character as a football player with characteristic haircut and, and sunglasses. Uh, and uh, the Dutch football player Edgar Davids simply suits Riot because uh, he, he, he saw that the character looks basically like him and the Dutch court agreed. As you can see, the resemblance is indeed uncanny. Uh, but what is particularly interesting in this case is that one of the crown evidence during the whole court proceedings was um, posted on Twitter by one of Riot's QA analysts who explicitly stated that Strike Illusion was uh, inspired by soccer pro Edgar Davids. So this gives us a lesson not only to make sure that you teach your artist, to you tell your artist not to take someone else's image uh, into your game without you knowing, but it also uh, teaches us that we really need to make sure that our employees know not to share you know, company-related details on their social media. And here is a case that uh, you are probably very familiar with. It's a case where Lindsay Lohan uh, decided to sue Rockstar for alleged usage of her uh, image in GTA 5 marketing materials. Lindsay stated that, uh, that Rockstar used her image and her very iconic, you know, finger pose uh, unlawfully and she wanted money for that uh, but the, you can see <laughs> easily that this, this lawsuit was kind of unfounded and and uh, the court dismissed the lawsuit uh, but uh, what is interesting here is that Rockstar confirmed later that the person who was uh, whose the character was modeled on was a model Shelby Wellinger here you can see her and uh, after it was revealed, the fans were still not satisfied, and many of them were trying to uh, prove that uh, it was Kate Upton, a British model, who was the person uh, on whom the, the girl was modeled on. And uh, to be honest, I, I wonder what the outcome of the whole court proceedings would be if it was Kate Upton who decided to see Rockstar. But as you can see, mm, this brings us to the problem of the so-called doppelgangers. And by doppelgangers, I mean sort of uh, accidental twins or, or doubles. Very often after the game's launch, uh, developers see lots of posts on various forums like Reddit that certain character uh, was modeled on particular actress, actor, sports person, whatever. And uh, here are a few examples. After the launch of Cyberpunk, many people thought that Panem was modeled on the actress Kristen Mace, and uh, although the image of both ladies uh, have similar vibe, you can see that the bone structure, eyes, nose, mouth, they're completely different, and that the similarity uh, claims were a bit exaggerated. And here we have some other examples. So uh, Eva Green was supposed to be at the uh, model of Siri. Oldgert was supposed to be the clone of David Beckham and a Jedi the Fallen Order uh, character uh, was supposed to be modeled on the Riverdale uh, actor. All right, so we have our city, we have people, we need to fill out space with something. We can fill it out with nature, of course, but uh, I believe that filling it out with objects, vehicles, art and poster will make it more uh, alive. So, the truth is that when it comes to all those elements I just mentioned, there are many pitfalls waiting for you, and analyzing every single detail is the topic for like a whole bunch of, of lectures, so we need to focus on the most important issues. Um, first of all, recreating real life looking objects. Uh, when you are recreating real life uh, looking objects, you should refrain from introducing well known brands existing in, in real life. So, I would say a big no go for a guitar named Fender or a Coca Cola bottle uh, because it's basically sending an invite for a lawsuit. Unless, obviously, you have a consent of the owner of the brand. And then, if you want to recreate an object, be it a table, lamp, bottle, whatever, uh, I suggest focusing on the functional uh, parts of the object. So, it's obvious that no one will uh, get protection on a simple square 
a piece of uh, plastic or wood on four legs. Not, not possible. But then, if we would go for something more sophisticated, like the table you see, with lots of decor, lots of figurines, etc., if you would copy it one to one, you'd probably uh, be infringing someone else's uh, right. And the same rules apply to to object, other objects and clothes. So, for instance, if you want to dress your character in plain t-shirt and jeans, probably it is very unlikely anyone can sue you. But if you want your character to parade in a dress uh, with safety pins, so something that is super similar to the iconic research dress, you might get in trouble. And here is an example from Cyberpunk that we lawyers had to take care of. Um, we introduced uh, Mr. Hideo Kojima, resp guy responsible for Metal Gear Solid series or, or Death Stranding, to cooperate with us, and he became an in-game character named Hideo Shioshima. And uh, while establishing the rules of cooperation, it turned out that not only Mr. Kojima's face will be put in the game, but also his iconic glasses. And as a result, we did not only have to acquire the consent of Mr. Kojima, but we also needed the consent of the manufacturer of the glasses, which we uh, obviously did. And this is why you can see the whole uh, persona of Kojima in the game. And other developers also deal with issues related to the elements of someone else's appearance. For instance, uh, after the, the likeness of LeBron James appeared in 2K, NBA 2K, uh, the, uh, the developer and the publisher received a lawsuit from the tattoo artist who created the two you can see on LeBron's arm. And the, the court dismissed the lawsuit, stating that it was fair use, that the artist sort of granted a license to LeBron James, who, and this license could be, you know, granted further and further, so like everything was fine. But this case shows that sometimes you will not even think about the stuff that can create an infringement, or at least can make you go to the court and, and spend some money on lawyers, because you'll be sued. Um, so we talk about objects, and uh, now let's take time to look at the vehicles. Uh, vehicles are so omnipresent, and their design has changed so much over the years that I believe that it's like one of the best uh, ways of showing particular era, giving the vibe of particular decades. And unfortunately, incorporating real-life cars is not very easy. First, vehicles are subject to multi-level protection, you know, copyright, trademarks, designs, etc. And second issue is that the car brand owners are used to licensing their brands to games. So not only the license can be pricey, because they can choose from many, many developers, but also it can be very limited. So uh, the car manufacturer might not want to see their car crashed or scratched or used in any way that you would like it uh, to be portrayed. And so while working on Cyberpunk, we created most of the cars from the scratch in-house, but we also wanted to include some real-life makes, and we did so. So apart from house-made cars, we have a Porsche car and Arch motorcycle, uh, which obviously were added into the game uh, during the cooperation with the respective manufacturer. Uh, but it can happen, for whatever reason, that uh, you cannot get a license for financial reasons, for artistic reasons, doesn't matter. Uh, what to do then? Well, I recommend uh, creating the, the cars in-house. In and what I'd recommend as well is that you should rather stick to self-made uh, names, rather generic shapes, unless you can make sure that no real-life car has the shape of the car you created. And uh, definitely you should avoid certain characteristic uh, elements of other cars. And for example, you can see the grill of Rolls-Royce cars, and uh, copying it would probably get you in, in trouble. And uh, why is it so important? Well, because if, if you don't, uh, you probably will get in trouble. You will get a lawsuit. You might have some nasty talks with lawyers of another party, 
And this actually happened in 2013 when EA got sued by Textron, the manufacturer of helicopters, uh, who stated that uh, EA used their machines illegally in battlefield. And EA decided to settle the lawsuit, so they didn't end up in a year-long, uh, years-long uh, court battle. But you know, it's not always the case, and uh, this is why it's better to avoid such unpleasant risks from the very beginning. Okay, so let's uh, move further. If we are creating a game set in a city in quasi-modern times, uh, there is no better way to make it alive as by introducing various brands, ads, posters, moving stuff. And uh, unfortunately, in most cases, if you would like to recreate the real life brands and put them in your game, so you would like to have McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Pizza Hut, etc. Unless you cooperate with those, the owners of those brands, you would be committing an infringement. And uh, for this reason, if you're not going to apply for a license, I really recommend creating all the brands in-house. And this is actually what we did at Cyberpunk, with Cyberpunk. We created all the brands as posters inside, and we actually had a whole team, separate team, that was responsible for creating the ads for, uh, for the game. And so when you're creating the ads, remember to avoid references, like obvious references to real life brands, as so you wouldn't like to end up uh, in uh, being accused of piggybacking on someone. And another tip is make sure that when you're using foreign words or weird uh, elements, symbols, that you are actually aware what they mean, because uh, it is quite easy to offend someone if you, you know, you put uh, the Japanese letters on the restaurant, it's in the restaurant name, and suddenly it occurs that it is something super offensive. And uh, some. Some developers decide to wink at players and, 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 and the society in general, like Rockstar. Uh, in their GTA games, uh, they introduce uh, brands like Apple and Sprite and adapt them to their games, where, uh, as you can see, it's Fruit and Sprunk. And uh, the truth is, not everyone will like this kind of joke. And uh, in 2006, the owner of a strip club uh, named uh, Playpen, sued Rockstar for infringing uh, their trademark, as it occurs that a Rockstar put a strip club named Pigpen in their game. And uh, as you can see, the, the logotypes uh, bear some resemblance uh, to the real club, and in this case, however, the US court uh, found that Rockstar's actions were an artistic maneuver in order to create a parody of all of Los Angeles, and uh, that there was no risk that anyone would think that the real strip club is somehow connected to, to Rockstar. So, good news for Rockstar. <laughs> but please remember that all the cases we're talking about today are, uh, we should look at them uh, through the prism of certain particular circumstances and certain particular legal orders, as every country has different rules and regulations and what is legal in U.S. or acceptable in U.S. or Australia might not really be fine with uh, Germ in Germany or Japan or, or Poland. And uh, here I have an example for you showing that sometimes not going for a real-life brand uh, might save you some trouble in the future. Um, according to the latest news, EA is uh, resigning from naming their iconic football series FIFA and so probably it is because of the end of their license deal and, and rumor has it that FIFA actually asked for more than one billion dollars for the usage of their trademark. And this is probably why from next year on we will be playing games under the EA Sports FC name. Uh, but, you know, the branding is always costly and risky, so sometimes resigning from realism might actually be, good, be a good move. Okay, so we went through the most important parts of uh, creating the real-life game assets, and I hope it will be at least a bit helpful for you when you'll be working on your games. And uh, in order to make your life slightly easier, uh, I have a few more hopefully helpful 
uh, comments that will complement what I mentioned today. So, when it comes to checking your gaming assets, I suggest taking the following steps. First, take a good look at circumstances surrounding your, your assets uh, and your game. Uh, what is the context of your asset usage? Uh, how relevant is it really for your game and the whole story, the whole gameplay? As uh, this will help you in assessing uh, whether recreating this particular asset is super important or whether, whether you can resign from it if uh, there are some legal bumps on the way. And secondly, I highly recommend conducting internet search. So check as much uh, information about the object you want to recreate, if it's a real life object, real life brand, real life building, uh, as possible. Because it might occur that it is no longer protected by copyright. It might occur that there is no trademark registered like that, etc., uh, etc. Et so this uh, is uh, really important to do as an artist because it kind of helps you in limiting the risk of uh, getting into trouble later on at the very early stage. Uh, thirdly, uh, I suggest becoming friends with trademark databases. There are multiple ones that can uh, that allow you to check whether someone registered a particular, particular trademark. And by doing so, by checking it, you will minimize the risk of infringing someone else's rights, or you can simply find the contact details to the owner of the brand, and you can ask them for uh, for license if you if you please to do so. And uh, last but not least, this is some private agenda. Is uh, please remember that lawyers are there for you, and especially in case of key assets like game name, uh, key visuals, uh, key characters. Uh, I highly recommend asking for help lawyers who have experience in checking in-game assets. Uh, they can help you in assessing the risk and uh, they can advise on necessary changes. And this is also why I encourage you artists to keep the sources of your inspirations always at hand. Because as a lawyer, in order to be able to assess your uh, creative work, I need to make sure that uh, I need to see your uh, source of inspiration and the final result. Uh, okay, so I believe that uh, it's time we went back to our case. So after you heard what you've heard today, uh, what you already know or knew, uh, what is your take on, on Mara's case? So who is in favor of uh, the writer? Please raise your hands, although I cannot see you. Okay, we have some hands on. Okay, and who thinks that Activision would win the, the lawsuit? Okay, so the majority of you are in favor of the publisher. Well, if you would ask me, I would answer as any lawyer. It depends. And I'm aware that it was a lot to take in. And uh, honestly, normally, such a training lasts a whole day or even a two. And as much as I would like all of you to remember everything, I believe that the most important parts are, first, when recreating buildings, you enjoy freedom of panorama. And of course, there are some traps that we mentioned today, but in general, you are free to recreate the buildings that you can see from the street. Second, when depicting persons, when introducing real life persons, please remember about taking consent and try to make the scope of the consent as broad as possible in case you would like to use the image in the future. Third, when including real-life objects, please do not copy them one-to-one -one, and please refrain from using real-life brands unless you apply for a license. And uh, it is also important to always keep the sources of your, uh, of your works and to conduct uh, applicable research on the objects you want to depict. But, uh, but the bottom line of all of this is uh, please do not be afraid to engage lawyers in your creative process. And, uh, you know, if you ask lawyers for consultations, you'll probably get your share of it depends. But uh, in the end, the lawyers are uh, professionals who can tell you how to drift in between, you know, the rocks like copyright, trademark, etc. So thank you very much. That's it from me. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to catch me during the lunch break because I believe we are out of time. And uh, I'm very open to talking to you. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much. I have a question. Um, as you have mentioned, um, a number of examples. And s most of them, I think you said, were settled outside of the courthouse. Um, but some of them did actually get it to the, to the courthouse. Um, and there was a trial. So how many of them are, like, if you, if you can say, how often this actually makes a, a trial a thing? Or maybe it's better for both parties to, you know, get an agreement on those cases? So uh, I'd say that most cases do not end up in court. It is uh, especially that many cases take place in the U.S. where cost of trial and cost of lawyers are super high. And it's definitely more practical to just try to settle it, uh, to write a settle, uh, settlement agreement and agree between the parties outside the court. Thank you very much. And yeah. Yeah. So if you have a totally made-up brand, you still do the same four-step search. Uh, as I mentioned, so first you uh, do the research, you just Google it, you try to see whether someone else is not uh, already conducting business activity under this name, uh, then you check the trademark databases, and if you still have trouble or, or doubts, or you think that, you know, it might be too similar to something, you can always ask uh, legal, at least uh, that's how it works at CDPR. <laughs> Thank you very much.